Uh, on to my introduction to, for Michelle Krask. Uh, give you the G for a change so you know what that stands for. Uh, and I have credits to give to those who helped me with this particular introduction, and you'll see a mix of people, and my apologies if I missed anyone who helped me with what you're about to see. So it began in Tasmania, which is a beautiful place to live, where Michelle was born and raised. But there are devils there, and Michelle may have been affected. She began life as a cute, carefree, and sometimes muddy little girl. Her sporting interests began very early in life. And here we see the earliest signs of approaching tasks from the ground up. And of going out on a limb and convincing other people to join her. She was a happy student from the very beginning. And she began the climb to great heights early on. Her first career ambitions combined athleticism, grace, and hard work. And we'll see some of that carry forward. She was a cat lover, even as she later had to ask her lab team what brand of cat to buy for her daughter. <laughs> her teenage experience was perfectly normal. Her professional career began with a BA from the University of Tasmania, of course, with honors. And then came the great migration to UBC for a PhD. She was advised to get out while you can with a scholarship to UBC. And it was a fortuitous move that developed her research interests in fear responses with mentor Jack Rackman. Her athletic endeavors continued with skiing and mountain climbing. It looks like you're smoking a cigarette, but I don't think that's true. <laughs> and on she went to SUNY Albany in the late 80s to work with Dr. David Barlow as a senior research scientist. And as he tells it, my first memory of Michelle is of a lost-looking young woman getting off a bus in Albany after completing a cross-continental trip all on the bus from Vancouver, where she had just received her PhD, ready to begin her first professional position without ever having visited Albany and never having met her prospective mentor. Trusting and generous soul that she was and is, she had simply taken the word of her PhD advisor, Jack Rackman, that this would be a good thing, and it was a good thing, for me at least, one of the most productive and rewarding professional and personal relationships in my long career that began that day. In Albany, her productivity continued to correlate with aerobic skiing and mountain climbing, and also with apres ski partying. <laughs> she kept these lifelong connections with her Albany colleagues through ABCT, and here they are at the Philadelphia conference. On, she moved to a faculty position at UCLA in the early 90s where she added snorkeling to her athletic endeavors and parachuting. Along came beautiful little Margot, I warned Margot this was coming, who received early training from mom in how to carry a heavy load and how to give that thing a good whacking. And the parties began as did the serious tennis game and the pleasure of three generations. So if we get back to Michelle now, what do her lab students say about her? She's incredibly smart, a genius, superwoman. Michelle is good at everything. She broke 200 on her first time bowling. Who does that? <laughs> did you see her line dancing in Nashville at ABCT? But she doesn't know how to ride a bike. And try as he might, Jack Rockman was unable to teach Michelle how to ride a bicycle, so she rode a tricycle. More student comments. She doesn't sleep. She remembers everything in detail, even when she's exhausted. She has a unique email style, cryptic, oddly phrased, downright bizarre. And so here are some Michelle-isms. Jolly good. 
Intermittent explosive disorder. Doesn't that make you think of diarrhea? <laughs> Great news that Scotland is not falling off the planet. Megan will oversee blood. Money is now available for improving the dungeon. I do want to know where that is. The Crask lab assistant job description is must be willing, even if not able, to dance, perform, and play games that incidentally also function as social anxiety exposures. Square dancing, ballroom dancing, murder mystery, Halloween, and she can dress the part with a curious resemblance to a Tasmanian devil, I thought. Michelle is a master of the lab party with a new baby in tow. And the parties continue especially when there's wine to be tasted. She can be professional when she tries, and also very focused. <laughs> she wears many professional hats. So if I'll get serious for a minute before she walks up here, professor of psychology, psychiatry, biobehavioral sciences at UCLA, director of the Anxiety and Depression Research Center, associate director of the Staglin Family Music Center, for Behavioral and Brain Health, co-chair of the Human Studies section of the Executive Committee of the UCLA Depression Grand Challenge, and a few more, editor-in-chief of Behavior Research and Therapy, associate editor of Psych Bull, scientific board member for ADAA, DSM-5 steering committee member, reviewer for a gazillion journals, participant in Institute of Medicine uh, projects, and president, of course, of ABCT. She's had continuous funding from NIMH since 1993 to study a variety of aspects of anxiety and depression. These are only a few of the areas that she has worked in. With a few publications, this is frightening, folks, 400 journal articles, we're almost there, at least by the latest CV I was able to find, four texts on anxiety, gender, basic science, and CBT, 19 editions of Therapist Guides and Self-Help Books with David Barlow and other colleagues. I refused to count her presentations and invited talks and keynotes and so forth. 23,000 citations and an H index of 87. That indeed is quite a president. And now it's time to hear from our terrific and impressive Michelle Krask. So, the theme of our 50th anniversary is to honour the past and envision the future. ABCT has been fortunate enough to have had visionaries, problem solvers and innovators to address our most pressing needs and to accomplish our goals. Please join me, first of all, in a heartfelt round of applause for our uh, past leaders who have contributed so much to the field and to our professional home, many of whom are seated in the front rows. If you would please stand so that we can applause. my early years as assistant professor at UCLA, I had the absolute honour and pleasure of working with Joseph Wolpe, uh, one of the ten founders of our organisation. Wolpe held an emeritus position within our Department of Psychology, and as many of my students know, I still have his swivel chair in my office. Um, I was particularly thrilled uh, when he arrived at UCLA, not only because of his major contributions to the field, but because he was in part a mentor to my mentor, as was mentioned, Jack Rackman, before I went on to work with Dave Barlow. When I teach cognitive behavioral therapy and, and theory to the first year clinical psychology graduate students, I usually begin by talking about his pioneering efforts. Dissatisfied with psychoanalytic methods, Wolpe turned to science for answers. 
So I figured it has something to do with Pavlov because um, Pavlov had, had, had entered into, into some medical courses and physiology and psychiatry, though very briefly. And um, so what I, what I then did, and uh, this was about uh, the beginning of 1945, I began reading all Pavlov's experiments. I wrote summaries of them and commentaries on each. And in fact, I read all of his commentaries and they are now archived at USC under the guidance of Jerry Davison. Um, on his own initiative, after convincing the head of his medical school in Johannesburg, Wolpe convinced the head to give him space to do his labor laboratory work, which happened to be the roof of the building, where he conducted a number of experiments demonstrating successful extinction of fear through counter conditioning in cats. And from this initial experimental work, followed by its application to a series of human samples, he formulated the first standardized and scientifically derived approach to the treatment of neuroses, as it was called then, systematic desensitization. And from this initial experimental work, he received tons of criticisms from psychoanalysts uh, for his novel, empirically derived approaches to treatment. I mean, you know, according to psychoanalytic theory, neuroses are due to, to uh, uh, repressed complexes, and you can't ever really uh, cure a person without de-repressing the, the, the complex. So, I mean, on, on their theoretical grounds, the per, uh, a patient co could not be cured because mm. the, the complex was there. I mean, they just, quote unquote, knew that. And so how do you view then the cause of neuroses? I mean, do you still apply that, that theory? That you mean their theory? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> He was quite definite about that. <laughs> so, nevertheless, he persevered tirelessly and continued to inspire others across his entire life. And his influence stretches far and wide, including to many members of our organization. And so it made me question, what was it that enabled Walpe and the others who founded the organization of ABCT to make such groundbreaking changes to the approach to mental health? And what has led many others over the last 50 years to continue to expand our horizons? Undoubtedly, some of this comes from personal qualities like courage, determination, wisdom, and ingenuity. And certainly these were characteristics of Wolpe, although as Jack Rackman always says, despite his unassuming style. But it was more than that. Our founders valued scientific methods as a guiding principle for understanding mental disorders, for developing therapeutic approaches, and for evaluating and improving their effectiveness. And indeed, this principle remains ABCT's primary mission till today. And second, by definition, they valued an openness to new ideas as long as they were guided by scientific inquiry. And what I will do today is return to the concept of the value of openness to new ideas as essential as we move forward. Now, because of the high value placed on the scientific approach to understanding and treating mental disorders, our founders led the way to a basic paradigm shift in mental health, away from non-testable treatment models and towards goal-oriented, empirically derived and empirically validated treatments. And our 
our continued respect for the scientific approach over the last 50 years has resulted in behavioral and cognitive therapies becoming the most empirically supported psychological treatment for a wide array of mental health and behavioral problems. And this is an achievement of which we indeed should be proud. But we have a long way to go. Let's take an example. Let's consider an eligible sample of individuals who are anxious or depressed. Now, we know that not everyone agrees to start CBT, and it's really hard to estimate this. But estimates are around 25%, let's say, who refuse to begin CBT. OK. We also know that of those who agree to CBT, not everyone completes treatment. Estimates of attrition vary greatly, but on average, we'll say around 25% fail to complete CBT. Of those who complete CBT, not everyone achieves a clinically meaningful response, meaning within normative levels, so quite a stringent criterion here, with the exception, perhaps, of specific phobia. And of those who achieve a clinically meaningful response, relapse is not uncommon, with estimates at around 40%. So if we put all of this together of an eligible sample, around 20% achieve clinically meaningful and sustained improvement except specific phobia. I realize this is a fairly stringent way of looking at it, but even with more lenient criteria, the results are somewhat disconcerting. We need to, and I believe we can, do better than this. Now, in addition to this upper limits on our effectiveness, we have to grapple with the enormous size of the problem with which we are dealing, not just in North America and other European and Western cultures, but globally. Lifetime prevalence rates for the more common disorders in most countries around the world that have been surveyed are above 25%. And for some reason, it's even higher in the United States. As we know, the burden of mental disorders spreads far and wide across all areas of health and functioning to family members and societies at large. Our traditional methods of treatment delivery, highly trained clinicians who provide one-on-one -on -one therapy, are simply not sufficient to meet the need. And this unmet need becomes even further amplified and complicated in those areas of the world that are under-resourced. Thus, we not only need to improve our effectiveness, we also have to reach places where the need is greatest. So I think we need to think big. And this is what UCLA is doing. What would happen if our greatest shared burden was lifted? Depression is the leading cause of disability, affecting over 300 million people around the globe. We lose 800,000 each year to suicide, more than murder and war combined. Yet we face an impossible void due to the desperate lack of resources in much of the world, leaving most of the suffering untreated. Now consider this, most people with depression can be diagnosed and actually treated using new technologies. In the smartphone and internet age, we see an enormous opportunity. We are building a global depression network to provide culturally adapted methods for diagnosing, treating and continuously monitoring depression. We're calling it the Depression Grand Challenge Worldwide. And when we launch, 
this global coalition will become the largest data collection effort ever in the field of mental health, unleashing untold insights that will fundamentally change our capacity to treat depression, sending lifelines that will transform hundreds of millions of lives. What would happen if our greatest shared burden was lifted? How would it feel? How would our world be transformed? We believe that the latest technologies will enable scalability far beyond that ever achieved to date. But at the same time that we are increasing reach, I believe we also need to improve our effectiveness for the reasons stated before. So this natural tension between both increasing effectiveness and at the same time improving reach is what I'll be addressing in the rest of this presentation today. Let me describe how I see us moving forward uh, to increase our effectiveness and our reach, touching on the four main concepts that were emphasized in this, our 50th anniversary. Technology and treatment, cognitive science, neuroscience, and dissemination and implementation. The first way for us to move forward, I believe, and this is my vision, is to achieve a greater understanding of the processes that contribute to psychopathology so that we can develop more precise treatments. As a field, of course, we have always relied upon scientific understandings in order to develop treatments that fit the disorder. But now the time is ripe for us to delve more deeply than ever before into the vulnerabilities and risk factors that contribute to the onset of psychopathology and the processes that are responsible for the persistence of or change in psychopathology over time. Greater understanding of this kind will help us to elucidate the targets for prevention and treatment. Once identified, those targets will allow us to refine our therapeutic strategies, optimizing those ones that shift the targets, removing those ones that do not, so that we streamline our treatments, making them more efficient and developing new treatments that directly target them critically. Then we can match the specifically targeted strategies to individuals rather than to disorders. This is an important step because of the heterogeneity in the critical processes that occur across individuals despite the fact that they present similar symptoms. So we know already that not all individuals with anxiety show an attentional bias to threat. We know already that not everybody who's depressed shows an inability to be motivated for or experience pleasure. There are variations that will lead to, I think, different treatments. Through such refinement and personalization, I believe we will increase the effectiveness of our treatments. Let's consider some of the risk factors we already have established in order to exemplify what I mean by this approach. For example, in our 10-year longitudinal project called the Youth in Motion Project, conducted by myself, Rick Zinbarg, and Sue Meinecke, we've already identified a number of risk factors, and I call them risk factors, not mechanisms, because we don't really know what the underlying mechanisms are, um, that predict the subsequent development of anxiety and depression over the next four, five, six years, as have others using longitudinal designs. Similarly, through our at-risk work, we've shown processes that are likely to be critical candidates for the emergence of anxiety and depression. These kinds of targets, some of which I've exemplified here, would be suitable for prevention. 
The deficit in fear generalization, which characterizes those who go on to develop anxiety, probably explains the persistence of fear. The overgeneralization of fear that characterizes those who go on to develop anxiety disorders probably contributes to the generalization to many different contexts and the pervasiveness of fear. Uh, neuroticism has been well established as a risk factor for anxiety and depression. The tendency to um, interpret ambiguous situations. Again, not for everybody, but for some people. I envision each of these risk factors being associated with a set of measures or uh, yeah, measures that actually will provide a profile of how each person looks and that each measure and risk factor will be associated with a therapeutic strategy. In this way, prevention strategies would be linked to the risk factors most relevant for a given individual allowing more precision. So in this case, the person is showing a deficit in fear extinction as measured by fear extinction recall, and they would be receiving fear or uh, extinction or exposure consolidation. They may show an attentional bias, so they might receive attentional bias training and so forth. And of course, some of our existing treatments, uh, so we've already identified a number of likely candidates responsible for the persistence of psychopathology, some of which overlap with the risk factors, which would be suitable as targets for treatment. So instead of prevention, this would now be treatment. And just as with pre precision prevention, I envision each of the critical processes being associated with a measure or a set of measures to establish each person's profile and with a set of targeted therapeutic strategies, with implementation of only those strategies that are relevant to a given individual. But these are just examples based on the targets that we have already identified. We need a far more comprehensive and deeply um, evolved understanding of the mechanisms responsible for psychopathology and its change. So how do we do that? First, as Emily Holmes and myself and Anne Grabiel have argued, we need to expand our horizons beyond our own knowledge base and collaborate with scientists who provide different perspectives all eyes on the same clinical problem so that we can understand the complete engine that drives psychopathology. Now that engine is going to involve multiple interactive parts from, the ce from cells to brain to behavior with collaboration from basic scientists, animal researchers, cognitive scientists, neuroscientists, and clinical scientists, and that, by clinical scientists, I mean the people who are applying these problems of, uh, applying treatments to these problems, have a far greater chance of learning about the engine that drives psychopathology and all its complexities. This is not to argue for a biological reductionist perspective, not at all. This is an expansionist perspective. It is to expand our knowledge base and work together. Outward behavior is going to be just as important as neural activation and genes in this model. All parts of the engine are critical and interact with each other. In fact, this collaborative scientist approach has already been taking place to a certain degree in the area of the translation of the basic science of fear, learning, and fear extinction to fear-related disorders that has led to new kinds of treatments, such as what some of you may already know of as the disruption of the reconsolidation of memory. Now, there are boundaries conditions to this treatment. It's, it's problematic 
when the fear memory generalizes. It's problematic when the fear memory is old, which happens to be the kind of fear memories that patients with anxiety disorders present with. But it's inspiring new ways of thinking about how do we treat these kind of conditions. We've been working with animal researchers on the effects of traumatization and how traumatization typically leads to context generalization so that the person with PTSD clearly starts to fear situations that resemble the original trauma context. And the way in which we have been doing that based on the rodent research is to involve hippocampal activation through behavioral or biological means because hippocampal activation strengthens the context specificity of the memory and it doesn't generalize as much. Conversely, when we do exposure therapy, we want the opposite. We want that learning to generalize as widely as possible. We want it to generalize to as many different contexts that the person will encounter after the exposure therapy is over. And so we use behavioral and biological methods to actually deactivate temporarily the hippocampus so that the memory is not tied to the context of the learning of exposure therapy. We've been working with cognitive neuroscientists, cognitive and social neuroscientists, on what is called affect labeling. This is a simple technique for using uh, language to label emotions that in a neural pathway model serves to down-regulate the amygdala. And in turn, the physiological and subjective reactivity to the fearful stimuli. We've, got, we've done this uh, in spider phobias and public speaking phobias. This is our first attempt in uh, vets with PTSD. And keep in mind here that these vets are actually exposed to very brief images that last 30 seconds only and simply label their emotional response to the image over a matter of weeks, 20 to 30 minutes each time. And what you can see is that, I'm trying to remember where I point the pointer, ah, there it is. What I can see is that, what you can see is that the amygdala response from pre to post treatment significantly reduces and correlates with the amount of improvement in the symptom severity. And finally, um, inspired by the uh, work on the appetitive motivational system, uh, Diego Pizzagalli and others, myself and Alicia Muret and Thomas Ritz and Michael Trainer and Helena Dow have been working on how can we use behavioral strategies to enhance reward learning, reward sensitivity, and um, the wanting and liking of reward, because traditionally our treatments haven't done that. And so we've developed a treatment, we call it positive affect treatment, uh, PAT. And as you can see, over the sessions, the positive affect actually approaches almost the population average in this treatment. This symptom has been traditionally quite resistant to change, certainly much more effective in the PAT treatment than the NAT treatment. But again, these are just examples. They're, they're little examples of what we can do. They're the tip of the iceberg of what we could achieve through greater collaboration with scientists from different perspectives working on the same problem. A more comprehensive understanding of the engine that drives psychopathology is going to give us the chance to really understand the mechanisms that explain the risk and the critical processes or identify new risk factors and new processes, hone treatments and develop new treatments. No doubt this will require an openness to new ideas. Let me talk about harnessing technologies. This is a second way of achieving a greater understanding of the mechanisms of psychopathology and to hone our treatment strategies to be more mechanistically focused. Actually, it's not that unrelated to the collaborative science model. 
Smartphones and wearable devices offer the capability of continuous monitoring of potentially critical features of psychopathology. For quite some time now, we've been doing ecological momentary assessment, where we look at subjective state and we're able to get good profiles of mood over the course of 24 hours or weeks. But let's add to that the latest work that can be done with smartphones in continuous passive monitoring of behavioral and physiological parameters like sleep, voice tone, activity or radius away from home, social interaction, physiological measures and skin conductance, and even blood sampling from my latest talk with engineers. The matching of active recording of subjective state with continuous passive monitoring of these behavioral and physiological indices as it's happening provides an extraordinary wealth of information, clearly much more representative than what we can get from a retrospective estimate on a questionnaire or even from a laboratory assessment that's conducted once every two to three weeks. Together, these kind of data are likely to reveal different clusterings of data or different trajectories of data that may actually predict psychopathology or the need for treatment or the response to treatment. And points of inflection or points of deflection on this continuous stream of data may provide critical windows when we can do more in-depth assessment change is starting to happen. Let's match that change with more in-depth biological, cognitive, neural, or behavioral measures so that we can truly understand aspects of the engine that drive the psychopathology. With the um, help of our engineers at UCLA who are very keen on doing this, I also envision that these technologies will allow the creation of a personal cloud that represents mental health status uh, so that individuals will be able to check in over time on a regular basis. How's my subjective state? How's my activity level? How's my stress level? which actually is missing from there. How's my um, skin conductance or my heart rate? And if there are dips or peaks, do I need to correct anything? Just in the same way that persons with diabetes may use regular glucose monitoring to correct their insulin levels or food intake. Now, not only do these rapidly advancing technologies help us to understand psychopathology, they also provide precise tools for treatment. The latest virtual reality devices, the immersive quality of these devices have made leaps and bounds in quality. And beyond the established utility for phobias, I could see these treatments being used for things like attention training or memory specificity training, or aspects of reward sensitivity training, like how do you teach somebody to really savor a positive experience or to feel compassion to somebody else? Um, in addition to the virtual reality, neuromodulation is also making great strides, whether it be transcranial magnetic stimulation or direct current stimulation, or the most recent work out of UCLA, which is using ultrasound in such a way that it can reach deeper regions of the brain. Now, what's the beauty of these techniques is not only the precision with which they can target critical processes, but they can be combined with cognitive and behavioral strategies. This is supposed to represent the ultrasound targeting the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which we kind of know is important to extinction and by proxy exposure therapy. What if we were to do exposure therapy as the person's undergoing the ultrasound? And conversely, cognitive strategies can prime those areas of the uh, brain that are most responsible for emotion regulation and perhaps might even facilitate the benefits of direct current stimulation. So this is not to exclude cognitive and behavioral strategies, but to blend these techniques together. And the one that really 
blows my mind are the newer techniques of neuro-reinforcement that would be perfect for that 25% of individuals who are so fearful and so avoidant that they will not even begin exposure therapy because we can now do exposure unconsciously so that they're not even aware of what it is that they're being exposed to. So I've talked about collaboration. I've talked about harnessing technologies. I want to touch on the topic of large samples. We need large samples in order to do this kind of work, in order to really appreciate psychopathology and develop appropriate treatments. We have been hampered by relatively small sample sizes and often by individual investigator groups. For example, while we recognize that many of the traits that contribute to psychopathology have a heritable component, we don't really know a lot about the genetic loci for most of the disorders. Um, this is from the Converge study in China uh, with a sample of 10,000 uh, trying to identify the, the pattern, the genetic um, patterns for depression. This requires samples on the size of 10,000 or more. Um, large samples are also needed to evaluate the complex interactions among that engine that I keep talking about. You know, we typically assume that of that list of risk factors or critical processes, if an individual has anxiety and they have attentional bias to threat, interpretation and neuroticism, we typically assume that all of those risk factors are going to amplify each other and lead the person to be at even greater risk for anxiety than if they just had one of those risk factors. But in some of our recent work from uh, the Youth Emotion Project, it's not like that at all. It's entirely complex. So that you could have a high score on one risk factor and a low score on another risk factor and be at the highest risk of all for subsequent psychopathology. So it's an incredibly complex set of variables. And in addition, as I already mentioned, there could very well be different causal pathways for different individuals who have the same basic set of symptoms. So the person who has depression, HIV, living in impoverished conditions in South Africa may have a different set of causal pathways than the adolescent who develops depression with poor social skills. In addition, the uh, precision approach to intervention, whether it's prevention or treatment that I've been advocating for, is going to require large samples in order to really establish which treatment strategy or set of strategies works best for each person. We had a discussion this morning about psychological conditions being much more complex than cancer. Of course it's more complex than cancer. There are so many variables that we have to take into account. So there are the different mechanisms, different processes, different treatments. Do we do these treatment strategies in isolation? Do we do them in sequence? Do we do them in combination? All of this is going to take large samples that are heterogeneous. So how do we do that? Well, we could have uh, large-scale collaborative studies, uh, funding permitting, um, or we could pool data from lots of different investigator groups as long as they're using common methods, common paradigms, and common measures. So I can actually envision storage of data on registered platforms along with the details for the methods and the measures. And here I'm talking about the methods and measures for the risk, for the mechanism, for the process. In fact, we, need, we really need to set some gold standards for the methods and measures developed again by this collaboration among the clinical scientists, the, the neuroscientists, the cognitive scientists, and the basic scientists. Of course, this is not meant to replace innovation at all. It's important for each individual investigator to continue their own 
innovative and unique approach to studying things, but this is to complement so that we can eventually aggregate data. Um, and with that, I would argue that we need this platform to actually have clearly operationalized therapeutic strategies so that we can ensure replicability across studies and greater precision in the linkage of the strategy to the mechanism or the process that we're trying to target. Um, I think members at ABCT are in an excellent position to develop these operationalizations of the different behavioral and cognitive strategies. For example, what is our inhibitory learning approach to exposure therapy? Can everybody else do exactly this that we do if they wanted to? We need to have that level of replication. And at the same time, it's going to avoid the tendency for this huge proliferation of strategies which essentially are the same. So these are some of the features that I think are necessary for us to, number one, look at what are the mechanisms responsible for psychopathology and its change. Number two, develop strategies that target those, me those mechanisms. Number three, personalize them to each individual and by so doing, improve the effectiveness of our outcomes. So that's the one side of the equation. How do we fit that with the need to scale up? So I think that we need to require, we need both combination of technologies and what I would call a tiered approach to precision uh, intervention. Technologies are going to provide invaluable methods for scaling up. Uh, we can use computerized adaptive testing, which is an online method of symptom testing to identify clusters of individuals who experience anxiety symptoms or depressive symptoms or manic symptoms or any kind of symptom. The advantage to computerized adaptive testing is that you can achieve the same level, in fact, you can achieve higher levels of sensitivity and specificity with fewer items, and you avoid responder bias because it's not the same set of items each time. The person gets a different set of items each time. Second, I imagine or I envision that internet-based tools or apps which can be delivered through the smartphone will provide the suite of measures that we need to identify the target. So I can envision smartphone apps for fear extinction. And in fact, we've been working with Talia Eli's group in London to develop exactly that so that she can implement an app to assess fear extinction in her large twin sample database. We could have apps to look at overgeneralization of fear, emotion regulation deficits, interpretation bias problems, even rumination problems, whether it's through tasks like distraction tasks or self-report. But it can all be delivered through apps on the smartphone. That way you can develop the profile. Where is the person showing the most dysregulation? Then, of course, the online programs or the apps, again delivered through smartphones, um, can actually de deliver a suite of targeted therapeutic strategies. Of course, there's been a proliferation in these online internet-based programs, mostly CBT. And while certain of them have demonstrated to be highly effective, as effective as therapists delivered CBT, what I'm talking about is something more streamlined. I'm talking about delivering strategies such as the attention control training or attentional bias training or problem solving training, which is already being done, or respiratory training if somebody's showing some dysregulation in their respiration. Um, this is an example led by Rafe Rose, one of my colleagues, who's developed um, a suite of apps. Um, and this particular one is for biofeedback 
as people go through a rather stressful task um, that he's developed for people who are people who are involved in high performance situations like astronauts. And of course, these would adapt, be adapted for different cultural contexts. Keeping that critical focus in the front all the time. So if we're talking about the woman in South Africa who has HIV and is depressed and is pregnant, then the goal would be not to provide generic CBT, but perhaps what she needs is a way to learn how to attend to her infant signals in order to reduce depressive rumination, improve her own negative affect, and improve the development of her infant. And in fact, Alan Stein's group at Oxford has done that in these settings quite successfully. Fourth, we can use these digital programs to train clinicians. Some of these already exist for the different aspects of uh, cognitive restructuring or exposure therapy or Chris Fairburn's behavioral activation programs. Marsha Linehan has done this with dialectical behavior therapy. And we can use this to maintain fidelity. So we all know that when we train clinicians in specific techniques, that does not guarantee that they'll continue to use them. So digital tools to train, but also digital to tools to keep people focused. And this is most relevant, perhaps you would think, for non-professionals, but it's actually the clinicians who need this most because clinicians have been trained in their own methodologies. And I'm talking clinicians being trained in non-evidence-based treatments. Um, they tend to go off target more than the non-professionals who don't have that backdrop. Um, we've done that quite successfully in primary care settings where we train nurses and social workers in how to deliver aspects of exposure therapy or aspects of um, cognitive restructuring. And then they use the program to actually guide them as they deliver it. Uh, Kate Taylor has led the effort in doing this for counsellors uh, who are working with individuals with substance abuse and anxiety problems. And along with Joe Himley, we're now doing this with counsellors in unemployment agencies. So you can see here, the counsellors have been trained um, using digital techniques, and now they're using the same digital techniques to actually maintain the flow of the session as they train the clients in how to do exposure therapy. Um, and finally, we can use the smartphone technologies and the wearable devices to assess treatment response. So if we put it together, the idea would be that those individuals who are mildly distressed or disabled would use largely self-guided online or app programs with brief check-ins from non-professionals, mainly to retain them in the program. Those who are moderately depressed or distressed, I should say, and disabled would again use the online and app programs but would have the option of more guidance by non professionals who are trained by the online programs, such that the professionals are reserved for the severely distressed and disabled individuals. Now that's not particularly novel. What is novel is that the content of the programs are these targeted strategies. So they will be based on what is most relevant to the given individual. And furthermore, Everybody will have the ongoing, as I envision it, self-monitoring, uh, sorry, uh, monitoring using smartphone um, devices or other wearable devices to record their subjective state, their behaviours or their physiology. And moreover, that monitoring will be used to guide treatment decision-making. So if somebody has been assigned based to this mild level, and they start to show through these devices signs of worsening, they start to withdraw, they start to become inactive, that might be a sign to shift up to a higher tier of treatment or even to a higher tier of treatment. Those individuals who've proceeded through the severe treatment 
end treatment, we're still monitoring after treatment's over, they start to show the initial signs of slippage, that might be a sign to reinitiate treatment in order to prevent full relapse. So that this entire program is completely dynamic. So that we're constantly using the remotely monitored data to gauge what kind of treatment does this person need. So to finish up, all of these features that I have described, the ways to identify mechanistically targeted strategies to fit them to the individual, to use remote monitoring and so forth, are now being employed at UCLA in the Depression Grand Challenge. Why? Because depression and anxiety are the leading causes of disability and soon to be regarded as the leading contributions to global health burden and disease. Our goal, believe it or not, is to reduce the burden of depression and related conditions such as anxiety by 50% by the year 2050 and to eliminate it by the end of the century. The Depression Grand Challenge has faculty from over 20 different departments involved. So it truly represents collaborative science. It is led by Nelson Freimer, who's a geneticist. Jonathan Flint, who happens to be another geneticist whom we, we recruited from Oxford for this. Larry Sapersky, who is a biochemist. And myself as the clinical scientist. At the center is what we call the 100,000 person study. So we'll be recruiting 100,000 individuals and following them for 10 to 15 years in order to identify the genetic and environmental risk factors for depression and all of the clinical phenotyping that we can from self-report to behavior to the brain and following these individuals for 15 years. The discovery neuroscience component looks at what are the mechanisms by which those risk factors actually confer risk. And it begins with the fruit fly and then goes up from there. The Innovative Treatment Center will take all of the information from the 100K study and the discovery neuroscience to develop mechanistically oriented treatments. And it will scale up to use the tiered treatment model so that we can manage what are expected to be over 50,000 individuals who actually need treatment. And then we have what's called the discrimination section where we're trying to reduce the stigma associated with depression. The goal is to then take this template as the video showed you earlier on and implement it in places around the world where we already have ongoing collaborations. So we have collaborations in Colombia, and in particular we're targeting individuals who live in highly remote mountainous regions and cannot get access to care at all. We're targeting, aside from UCLA, an area of California where the rates of poverty, depression and suicide are extremely high. It's called Imperial Valley. We're targeting Uganda, particularly street youths who've been traumatized, many refugees. We're targeting South Africa where the risk of HIV is still increasing in adolescent girls associated with risky behaviors and depression. And we're targeting China, which is where we have the genetic component already established and where psychological treatments are very rare. So, we have come a long way since ABCT began 50 years ago. Just as was obvious for our pioneers, willingness to test new methods and models is essential for progress. Yes, CBT is exceptionally empirically supported and experimentally strong, but we should always explore uh, other avenues that augment cognitive behavioral therapy and sometimes even lead us in new directions. 
As I said, we have come a long way. We still have a long way to go. So let's take a step into the future. Thank you. It is my great pleasure to thank Michelle Krask for a wonderful year as president of ABCT and for an outstanding talk. And so here is the, get you get your gavel back. <laughs> you can't see it, there's a gavel on the front here. So thank you very much. <laughs>